So the big question we should be asking, how would the crisis in Sudan impact on the already messy security situation in Nigeria? Wow. I don't want to imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> This is Premium Times Half Hour every Thursday at 11 a.m. Imagine leaving Nigeria to settle in another country, maybe as a student or to start a new life. And then a war erupts in this country, airports are closed, there's no food, no light, no internet, and you're trying to secure a safe place to hide. This is the current situation of Nigerians living in Sudan. Welcome to Premium Times Half Hour on Premium Times Podcast channel. I'm Titi Lope Fadari, and I'll be discussing this issue with, will I say President? <laughs> Premium Times' senior reporter covering foreign affairs and the diaspora, Chiamaka Okafo. Hi, Titi. Hi, Chiamaka. Why are you looking pretty today? <laughs> well... Maybe because Joe Biden just announced a re-election bid or not. So are you supporting him? Because um, a Democrat, maybe. <laughs> that may be why. But yeah, I think he's, he's a better option. I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, so maybe that's why. But that's secondary. That's not why we're here. Today. All right, yeah, sure. We'll be discussing that much later. <laughs> so on this show, Premium Times Half Hour, we discuss important issues and matters of national importance. Premium Times is Nigeria's leading investigative and accountability platform, and we bring this show to you weekly as part of our mandate of providing the, the information you need to make informed decisions. The show spotlights exclusive reports produced by Premium Times reporters from in-depth investigations, unique analyses to human angle stories. Um, but before I delve into today's um, report, I'll be sharing some interesting stories we published during the week. During the week. First, we have an exclusive with the headline, Russia-Ukraine War Report Identifies Risks in Expansion of Nigeria's Gas Production. The said report in this story is titled, Gas Expansion and the Energy Transition in Nigeria and the Niger Delta. It said Nigeria's weak enforcement of standards and regulations has enabled oil and gas companies to continue to operate without due care. It also identified some possible socio-economic challenges Nigeria may face in its plans to expand gas production. The second report is an analysis titled Time to Reaccess um, Terrorism Prevention in Nigeria and Other African Countries. This report emanated from the, 2022, the 2023's um, Global Terrorism Index, which revealed that 60% of deaths attributed to violent extremist extremist groups in 2022 occurred in sub-Saharan Africa. It raises question if it is time to reassess what needs to go into preventing violent extremism and specifically recruitment into terror groups in, in Africa. And on a final note, one year after Alafin's transition, Oyo Messi and Oyo Indigens await Governor, Governor uh, Mackinday's announcement of a successor. The report notes that the seemingly slow process of choosing a new alafi of Oyo is causing disquiet in the, in the kingdom one year after the demise of the long-reigning alafi Lamidi Adeyemi. So you can get more details on this report on our website, www.premiumtimesng.com. And I'll go on a short break, and when I return, we'll be discussing the conversation on the plight of Nigerians in Sudan. News beyond the surface. Investigations that uncover deep secrets. Analysis with thought-provoking perspectives. Reports that focus on human interest. Premium Times, a leading digital news platform, brings you these and more every hour through videos, written and podcast reports. Visit our website on www.premiumtimesng.com and follow us on all social media platforms for timely updates on politics, entertainment, sport and business. Don't miss out. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is Premium Times Half Hour on Premium Times um, podcast channel. I am with 
Shamaka Oka for Premium Times' is senior correspondent covering foreign affairs and diaspora. And we'll be discussing the Sudan war and how it affects Nigerians there. So Chamaka, tell me, for people who are not aware of what's going on in Sudan, um, can you tell, tell us how the war emanated and um, basically the current situation in Sudan? Okay, so a little background would help us understand what's happening in Sudan. Sudan is one of the poorest countries in the world with 46 million people, not East Africa, but also one of the countries that has a large residue of you know, mineral resources, and I think gold, which um, uh, reports have said Russia is exploiting, and there's an exchange between Sudan and Russia on the gold mines, and the Wagner group are there as, you know, doing that. Well, back to the crisis in Sudan. Sudan is not a country, it's not new. It's not a stranger to crisis and unrest. In fact, when the former head of state or the president, if you like, Omar al-Bashir, who was um, the leader for about 30 years, he came into power in 1989, and he was the leader of the country from 1989 to 2019. So very recently, you know, he left power. Um, so on assuming power, Sudan was already going through a 21-year-old crisis between the North and the South. When South Sudan wanted to secede from um, Sudan itself and finally got what it wanted, eventually, there's now a South Sudan. So South Sudan was initially a part of Sudan, but of course there was clamor for secession and self-determination. But this is just to say that Sudan is not a stranger to crisis and has always been in crisis and all. Um, Omar Bashir, so the very recent crisis we're seeing in Sudan started, I dare to say, in 2019 when Omar Bashir was ousted by the military in 2019 and then a sovereign council was, was created. Now, the sovereign council is a leadership by the military and civilian in Sudan, you know, trying to put an end to what looked like and inherit a monarchy in Sudan by Omar Bashir. And Omar Bashir is facing a lot of charges from the ICC, including genocide and other issues in Sudan, but that's on the side. So from 2019 um, to 2021, you know, the Sovereign Council was leading, but of course, they were loggerheads, there were issues they couldn't agree on, and of course, they kept fighting each other. But this, the, the, the cover blew off in 2021 when the military led by Abdel Fattah al-Bahan al -Bahan, sorry um you know arrested Abdullah Hamdok who was the civilian leader in the sovereign council arrested him and other members of the civilian rule who were part of the sovereign council so they arrested them and then dissolved the sovereign council and took over, you know, government. It became a, a military government fully. Okay. A coup happened in 2021. Now, 2021 school made it 35 coup d'etats in the history of Sudan. That's including attempted coup. So this goes to say that Sudan, for all we know, has been at war. Okay. Almost all its life. Because if 2021 is 35 coups, mm. including attempted ones, then... This goes to show you the kind of living condition um, Sudanese have been in, have existed in all their lives. And then you hear of you know, poor living condition, there's always problems with fuel, with food. There's a lot of crisis going on in Sudan, okay. aside the, you know, the power tussle. Okay. Now, in 2021, um, Abdel Fattah and his group took over government saying that they wanted to protect safety and security and give the youth of Sudan the future they wanted for the nation. Okay. After that happened, young people took to the streets protesting. Anti-coup protesters, they didn't want this. They needed to move into civilian rule. Now, note that in 2021, when Abdel Fattah and his group took over government, they promised that the country would go back to civilian rule July 2023. Okay. Now, this is May 2023. The fighting has been going on since last Saturday, or two weeks ago. I beg last Saturday was one week of fighting in Sudan. Okay. This, is, this is Tuesday. Yeah. So Sudan has been fighting for seven, eight, nine, 
10 days. I think this is the 11th day of the fighting going on in Sudan. And there has been four failed attempts at a ceasefire to open humanitarian corridor in Sudan. As of today, the U.S. has broken the 72-hour ceasefire in Sudan. It appears to be holding, but there are still sounds of gunfires in different parts of Sudan. So the question I'd like to ask, is the ceasefire really happening? Mm. Because CNN is reporting that it, it appears right. to be holding. Okay. But there are gunfires in other places. Nigerian students are stuck in this clash between the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, and the Sudan um, Armed Forces. Now, the Sudan Armed Forces are led by Abdel Fattah, okay. who was the guy, the leader of the coup in 2021, remember? Mm -hmm. And then Mohamed Dag Daglo is the leader of the RSF. Okay. Interesting thing about these two men is that they were partners. They partnered to carry out the coup of 2021. Oh, wow. Okay. And now there's a fight. You know, power really, power really messes a lot of things up. And then we see that playing out in Sudan. Now, the cause of this quarrel, I, I like to say quarrel, this is bickering between two elephants and then the grasses around are suffering, suffering. Mm -hmm. is, is the fact that, you know, there's, it talks on who should wield the power. So the conversation is going on how to incorporate the RSF into the military okay. and then move on to a civilian rule in, by July 2023. Mm. But we don't know if that's still going to happen now, given mm. that this fight is going on and a lot mm. of destruction is happening in Khartoum and Meroe, where you know the airports are being destroyed. So if you want to take flight... It's just impossible. You know, in every war the winner or the leader or the, vic the victor of the war is one who has control over key areas. Mm. And now the airport is key. Because if aids are going to come into the country, they will come into, through the airport and through borders. Mm. So the first places they go to are the borders, the airports, um, the state house, if there's anything, or the presidential palace, depending on what each country describes their mm -hmm. own buildings as. So these are the places you find that both the RSF, that's the Rapid Support Force, and the Sudan Armed Forces are claiming to be in charge of different places mm -hmm. at different times. Mm -hmm. So this minute, RSF says, oh, we are here. The next minute, the Armed Forces says we're there. So it's quite confusing to say this is what's going on here. But what we know so far, according to the United Nations, is that over at least... 427 people have been killed wow. in the ongoing crisis. Okay. And I always like to add the caveat that these are reported. These are the ones we see. And not the ones that You know, no one reported. knows yeah. exactly what's going on with them. And at least, you know, so another... That's just within a week. That is within a week. Wow. And so we don't know how long this is going to continue. And it's quite scary the way, you know, the fighting is going on, different interests, different backings for different groups. Interestingly, an Al Jazeera report has, you know, revealed that the RSF may have backing from Russia's Wagner group. Okay. And if you pay attention to the footprints of Wagner in Africa, it's not exactly a great one. Okay. But Wagner has also denied that it doesn't have any active participation in the war. So in the ongoing crisis, I beg your pardon, because it's not a war yet. So we can't, we can't call it a war. But then going by what we see Wagner doing in Ukraine, okay. you can imagine. And then, of course, the armed, the armed forces, the Sudan military, people say, oh, they have backing from the West. Hmm, interesting. Okay, let me just cut you there. So let's bring this home. Yeah, like you earlier mentioned, there are some Nigerians there. Do you know how many Nigerians are currently in Sudan? So we don't have at the moment the exact number. Okay. And I've tried to reach out to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to ascertain what the exact number is, and I'm yet to hear back from them. But we see figures around five million, five thousand. Well, you you can't a, see. That's a lot. But what we know for sure is that there's a huge number of Nigerians yeah. in Sudan. Um, Abike Dabri Erewa, the, the chairperson of Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, said on Twitter that the richest person in Sudan is a Nigerian. Mm. That should, that's, that goes, counts for something. It goes there, there is 
something about Nigerians in Sudan. And of course, Nigeria and Sudan share a long history, especially northern um, Nigeria, Islamic history, of course. Most of the Islam that came into Nigeria through the north, um, history has some historians say came through Sudan. And of course, most students in Sudan are sponsored by their parents, including state governments, to um, to study different courses ranging from Islamic studies, including, you know, the famous Sanusi, Lam Lamido Sanusi, mm. studied, you know, Islamic um, uh, studies in Sudan as well. So, I mean, there is a long a relationship that dates back between Nigeria mm -hmm. and Sudan. So you would imagine that, you know, we have a large population okay. um, in Sudan. So we don't know the, the exact number, but we know that there are a lot of um, Nigerians in Sudan. And of course, in the coming days, hopefully between now and tomorrow, we're mm -hmm. able to get the, exactly. the figure from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because then we can't just um, speculate and say, oh, we think it is, we have to be sure what we're dealing with. All right, so um, I came across a TikTok video um, stating that or claiming that um, some Africans are allowed to pass through the land borders, but not Nigerians. Nigerians are told to turn back. So um, if I want to ask, first of all, if this claim is true. And if it's true, is there like a personal vendetta against Nigerians? But, but because you, you mentioned now that, according to Abike Dabiri, that a Nigerian is the richest person in the country. So is there like a personal vendetta against Nigerians in particular? Um. So first on the Ethiopia border passage thing, it appears that it is true because the Nigerian embassy in Ethiopia had put out a letter to the Ethiopians saying, on the 23rd of April, of course, um, the letter was asking to allow these people passage because in its, its international law is in international understanding in terms of in times of war there's certain waivers people should get you can't expect someone fleeing from war to go and obtain a visa and you know all those funny things you ask for at borders why would you do that now i cannot say for sure that other african countries were allowed to pass the borders but we know from the letter written by the embassy of nigeria and ethiopia and the permanent mission to the african union and the united Nations economic commission for africa that you know nigerians were not allowed to pass through so they are they have written this letter making a case for nigerian students and nigerians to be allowed to pass through according to the the, the letter so the Embassy is saying, and I'm reading this verbatim, information at our disposal reveals that about 2,500 Nigerian students who have escaped the ongoing military confrontation in Khartoum are now stranded at the Galabat metama border towns between Sudan and Ethiopia. This is consequent on the students not possessing valid entry visas into Ethiopia. So it's a visa question there. The same ministry may wish to know that it is a war situation in Sudan mm. and that people are bound to seek refuge in safe places. Okay. Accordingly and in line with international humanitarian law and the existing cordial relationship between our two countries, that the government of Nigeria is requesting the urgent intervention of the Ethiopian government with the facilitation of humanitarian safe passage to the stranded Nigerian students. All right. So you see that, you know, it's it's a given, and we saw that happen with the Ukraine, the ongoing war in Ukraine. People moved to Poland, they moved to Moldova and Hungary, and it was easy for them. Of course, there were cases of, oh, people were treated badly, racism and all of that. And this brings me to the question of Afrophobia. Okay. And so you ask, is Afrophobia a thing? Yes, it is a thing. You know, so when we are outside of our dear continent, Africa, we address all ourselves as, oh, we are Africans, Brand, yeah. we are blacks. And when we come in... Within ourselves. We, we tend to, you know, spot the differences. Look at what is happening in Tunisia. Look at what is happening in South Africa. It's telling that Afrophobia is a thing. Now, do we want to continue like this? What, what would the world say to us? How would the world treat us? Now, so that's the thing that I don't know if it's peculiar to Nigeria. Okay. 
But then when you go to South Africa, you see that there's an animosity between South Africa and Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So Zims and South Africans don't see eye to eye. That's a question there. Why is this so? That's a question we should ask ourselves. So it calls for, you know, introspection as, as Africans. If we're if, not united. Yeah, so if we're facing racism from Europe, for instance, or from America, should we also do this to ourselves, do this to ourselves as well, especially in times, in a time like this? And now, we look the other way, the other border country, Chad, who is a border country to Sudan. The UN says it's, it is expecting to 70,000 refugees into Chad in the next few days as a result of um, the ongoing clash in Sudan. Already, there are over 10,000 refugees who have moved very quickly to Chad. Now, if Chad had turned them away, remember that Chad is also a crisis-torn country. Mm. Chad, of course, there was a cool situation in Chad, but it's also in transition. There's transitional leader Idris Deby now, who I hope keeps the transition moving so we can move back to civilian rule in Chad. But when you look at the bigger picture, this paints for Africa and the region, it's problematic. It seems we don't learn any lessons from what has happened Happen prior before. to now. You look at Libya, where's Libya today? What has happened in Libya? Look at Congo. Hmm. For years, Congo is still torn. Recently, hmm. Kivu is like, what's going on? Kinshasa is like, so the constant fights, and we're not learning anything from you know, watching the documentary around the lives of people who have been affected by crises and coups, counter coups and all of those things, the power tussle. Ethiopia just when called the truth between the three gray fronts and the Ethiopian government. And they are working gradually with IGAD to see that, you know, there's full reconciliation and Ethiopia is back on track. So what does this say to us? Burkina Faso is there on the side. Mm. Mali is there on the other side. Guinea. And these are things happening around us. What lessons are we taking? What lessons are we ignoring as a people? Now, I'll just come back to the situation of Nigerian students in Sudan to say that the Nigerian government has said it is, it is working tirelessly to see that the students are evacuated safely. So you know what? I don't want you to talk too much on that because we're going to, we're, I'm going to ask you a question on that. But we'll go on a short break, and when we return, we'll talk about how um, the consequences of this um, crisis um, on uh, Nigeria and um, what the Nigerian government is doing about it. Stay tuned. This is Premium Times Half Hour every Thursday at 11 a.m. Welcome back to Premium Times Half Hour, and um, I'm here with um, Chiama Kaokafo, who is Premium Times' senior correspondent covering foreign affairs and the diaspora. And we are talking about the Sudanese war and how it's crisis, I beg your pardon, and how it um, affects Nigerians who are living there. So um, let's take it back to the Ukraine-Russia war, um, which caused a um, few crises and um, shortage of wheat, which saw a lot of consequences, basically. So how would you say the um, Sudanese crisis is different from um, that of the Ukraine? And how can it, how is it going to affect Nigeria, basically? Because for the Ukraine, um, Russia, we saw the few crisis situation and then uh, shortage of, shortage of um, wheat. Do you have something similar economic-wise that could affect Nigeria, too? I think the first thing that comes to mind on how the crisis in Sudan is going to affect Nigeria will be security. Okay. I'll take us back to Libya. Because for me, in Africa, Libya exemplifies how much crisis in one place could affect an entire continent. Mm. Proliferation of arms from Libya, small arms, is a major contributor to what we see today across Africa as fight pockets of violence here and there, insecurity. And Nigeria is benefiting in no small way from what's happening. And so what's happening in Sudan, 
the question you ask at the end of this fighting, which we hope will end, mm -hmm. what happens to all the arms that have been put in different hands? Mm -hmm. Where would they go to? Sudan is a stone throw away from Chad. Okay. Chad is a stone throw away from northwest Nigeria, mm. which today is a boiling point. Northwest Nigeria today is like a big pot where you have oil boiling and so you just need to dip your finger to feel the impact. From bandit tree to Boko Haram to kidnapping, these groups make use of arms. Hmm. People also argue that these terrorist groups have ties in Sudan as well. They run to Sudan for refuge and all of those things. That line, Nigeria, Chad, Sudan, a lot of things happen around there. A lot of trade between this terrorist group happened around this area. So the big question we should be asking, how would the crisis in Sudan impact on the already messy security situation in Nigeria? Wow. I don't want to imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. I mean, the economics of it is that people who sell arms will make a lot of money within mm. this period, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Good business for them, but to the detriment of who and what? Now, when refugees start to move, perhaps when Chad is overboarding, the refugees will move into Nigeria. Nigeria will need to cater to those people. They add to the IDP population in Nigeria. Hmm. So there's money going to be mapped out to take care of people here and there. The UN, for instance, will need to do things. The Ministry of Humanitarian mm. in Nigeria would also take responsibility for, for a few because it's part of you know, the diplomatic relationship we share with different people, especially Chad, which really like Buhari's. You know, Buhari shares a good relationship with Chad, and we've seen it. Um, and this is what our foreign policy says, by the way, so it's not peculiar to Buhari. Concentric circles. But Buhari said, said clearly that his concerns are our immediate neighbors, the West African region, Africa, then the world. So if Chad is affected, we are affected. Mm. So we must make sure that nothing is happening in Chad. How can we make sure yeah, that? Yeah, we have to make sure... Nigeria is the big brother. We have the military presence. We have mm. the numbers. So if we want to make sure that border community, if we want to make sure that Northwest Nigeria is safe, Chad must be peaceful. And so when we ask questions like, oh, why is Nigeria sending this and that to countries around us? This is why. Hmm. If Nigeria must be peaceful, these countries must be peaceful. Anything happening in Chad will feel that there will be a drop down menu for us to pick from. Which one do you want? Do you want the gun or do you want the kidnapping? You know, and this is on a light note, but the reality is, you know, Chad must be fine. If country um, states around Chad will be fine. Okay. Niger must be the same thing if we want to. So those kind of things. We have to make sure. So for me, top on the list of what will, what will be the fallout of this crisis will be yeah, security, security concerns. And of course, there will be humanitarian issues. And already in Sudan, there are alleged cases of sexual violence going on. Oh, so wow. Women and children. I bear in the brunt. What we, I mean, the spoils of war, right? The spoils of crisis. It's always on women and children. The men as well. Women will lose their husbands. Children will lose their fathers. Unintended pregnancies. Brothers. Interestingly, one of the students I spoke to in Sudan noted that one of them had gotten robbed and stabbed. Ooh. But fortunately not there. But he could not confirm it. But that was a story going around, going on around their student community. This is what's going on already. So... Even in the crisis, some unscrupulous people have found a perfect platform to ply their trade. Hmm. 
we're, we're running health as skelter, but there's someone who needs care, medical care. Yeah. There's someone who needs to obtain your bag from you. Mm. There's someone who needs your phone. Mm. Someone who needs, you know, a lot of things are going on and we're not even starting to account for that. We just need to pull people out of these spaces mm. alive, first of all. But these other things, we'll start to hear of them pretty soon. So on what yeah. everybody would want to know, so I understand that Spain sent like four aircraft to East African country of Djibouti to evacuate their citizens. Um, the German Defense Ministry also made similar attempts and then also even the Swedish government. Um, but from Nigeria, the official in charge of Nigerians in diaspora is saying, that's Abike Dabri saying that for now there's nothing that can be done because the airport is shut. Um, but they are making an arrangement. I think I saw your report where you put the arrangement in quotes. So I want to ask, what do you know as of now what the arrangement is? So there, there, as of yesterday, there was a plan to move people to Egypt's land border today. But from my last check, that arrangement is also on a halt. Okay. I don't know what's happening or why it's been halted. But I would imagine that, you know, they want to be sure that it is safe for them to pass through all the military checkpoints and all of that. You don't want to be the scapegoat in a clash that doesn't concern you. So with that, I agree and understand where the Nigerian government is coming from on, you know, passage and how it should be run. Are there better ways of communicating this to you know, allay fears and put some kind of confidence in the minds of people, I would say yes. There are better ways of communicating with people, especially um, parents who have their kids out there. Everyone will be frantic. Anyone whose child is caught up in a situation like this will be very frantic. So you'd understand with people. I mean, and I also don't subscribe to the kind of abusive languages, you know, Nigerians use in expressing themselves and holy. It's not easy to coordinate because most times you don't even get the kind of response you're looking forward to. But again, you have to give feedback to Nigerians who are waiting to listen to you. So, yeah, I be rightly said that, you know, aircrafts can fly. The airport is it's in sure. a sorry state. Okay. Most countries that have taken out their people have used military aircraft. Some have gone by road to neighboring Djibouti, Cairo, and all of that. But this is also where you now ask what kind of diplomatic relations do different countries have? Mm. At what level are their relations? I read on Al Jazeera that the Sudan army last week of course, the UK and US have started evacuating, but they, offered, they said they would help evacuate nationals of US and UK. So as of today, my last check, South Africa said it has commenced evacuation. evacuation. Saudi Arabia, since last week, has started moving its people and some Jordan people as well. Belgium, um, India said it had done that. The Netherlands, the US, UK, France, China, Jordan, including Ukraine said it evacuated its citizens, um, about 100 of them from Sudan. Now, the thing about international relationship, diplomatic, whatever, and such, such issues is that you can't put out your plans, all of your plans, out in the open it might be jeopardized by one thing or the other. So you would want to, you have no option than to understand with the Nigerian authorities that we are, we are working behind the scene. Unfortunately, we can't give you word for word details on what we are trying to do. But I know that there's an ongoing conversation on how to move the students away from Sudan. A number of them are in Khartoum the capital where this is going on. I also understand that a couple of them, 
a number of them, I beg your pardon, have also moved with their landlords, their Sudanese <laughs> landlords, to their villages mm. where these fights have not got into. So, I mean, it's important, and the government has warned that it's important that students stay together and not move on their own because you don't have a pass from the military. So if anything happens to you, we can't account for you. And that's putting too much baggage on the Nigerian government. So if your government has said stay at a place, Ghana is also planning to evacuate its own citizens. But you have to be together. You have to be at a place. So if we say converge at the Federal Secretariat, for instance, you should be there. I mean, of course, it's only human instinct to run to safety when you feel your life is threatened at the secretary body. It's also important you communicate. It's it's go it's bad enough that you know there's a crisis going on, but it's going to be even worse that there are different instructions on where to be and where to go. So people need to. I. I'm now, for fear of sounding like Nigerian governments, we need to be calm because it's only when you're calm that you can, you know, reason properly, reason properly on how to get yourself to safety. So we need to be calm at the same time, be in touch and on board with instruction and information being shared. There's a Telegram group and it's a WhatsApp group created by the Nigerian community in Sudan to pass information to students and Nigerians who want to be evacuated. It's, it's important that we know that there will be people that won't want to leave Sudan. Mm. In the same way, there are, there are still Nigerians in Ukraine today. So the government is doing what it can, but we also, as citizens, need to cut them some slack and that this is a crisis situation. It's a serious confrontation going on in Sudan. And the government of Nigeria cannot interfere in that process. It's international law. You can't, you can't get in there. It's, it's not your business. Your business is to negotiate and reach an agreement on how your people can be evacuated or to join the international community to call for a ceasefire and bring the warring parties to table to negotiate. But you can't, of course, do more than this. Like we'll say, you know if you do pass yourself, that's, that's how to end this. All right, so in the words of um, Chiamaka, she's saying that you sh if you're listening to this, if you're a Nigerian in Sudan, you should keep calm and be hopeful that the Nigerian government um, comes in time to rescue you. So this is where we'll round off um, today's episode. I hope you had a, an amazing time with us. Make sure you keep the date with us on Premium Times Alpha every Thursday. Again, this show is brought to you by Premium Times, the leading multimedia news platform, which serves you every minute stories that can help you make informed decisions and hold public officials, individuals, and organizations accountable. We have cartoons, videos, podcasts, and other interesting content for your delight. And for timely updates on politics, entertainment, sports, and business, visit our website, www.premiumtimesng.com, and follow us on all our social media platforms. I'll be here again, um, same time, same day, from Chiamaka and myself. It's um, goodbye, and have a great weekend. News beyond the surface. Investigations that uncover deep secrets. Analysis with thought-provoking perspectives. Reports that focus on human interest. Premium Times, a leading digital news platform, brings you these and more every hour through videos, written and podcast reports. Visit our website on www.premiumtimesng.com and follow us on all social media platforms for timely updates on politics, entertainment, sport and business. Don't miss out.